Hello, everyone. I am so thrilled to introduce you to Mr. Kevin Young. Mr. Kevin Young is the new director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I, I am so honored to have him here today as he was before he was at the National Museum, he was also at another AAAM institution, which was the Schomburg Center in New York. Um, and here he is again in, 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 in wonderful form um, as the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I introduce you to the phenomenal Mr. Kevin Young. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Young, the Andrew W. Mellon Director for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It is my pleasure to introduce Robert F. Smith. In 2016, Mr. Smith donated $20 million to our museum and became one of our founding donors, a special group of contributors who gave early and generously to the museum. His gift established the Robert F. Smith Center for the Digitization and Curation of African American History, better known as the Smith Center. This center serves as the burgeoning digital humanities and public history forum for the museum. It introduces communities to the extensive work done at the museum, but more importantly, it opens doors beyond the National Mall. It's comprised of community and professional curation projects, an internship and fellowship program, and the on-site Family History Center, where people come to collaborate, they access collections and histories, they continue their education and receive genealogical support for institutional and communal partners. The Smith Center staff connects with institutions, families, and emerging professionals across the country to build communities dedicated to preserving local histories. And they've welcomed tens of thousands of visitors to their in-person and digital programs over the last five years. Now, five years ago, Mr. Smith's generous gift initially ensured we had a physical space in the museum dedicated to guiding visitors through genealogy research. And this Smith Center is so important for that. But what has truly been transformative and visionary about his gift are the corollary programs, partnerships, and outreach that have taken root since the museum opened. He remains one of the most philanthropic supporters of the museum, and he helped establish the museum on the mall and to fuel in the type of innovative, far-reaching connections that the museum has come to define itself by. As we all know, Mr. Smith's generosity has also extended well beyond our museum walls. From paying off student loans for the graduating class of Morehouse in 2019, and beginning an initiative to help all HBCU students pay off their student loans, he's promised to continue his visionary and innovative philanthropy throughout his lifetime, signing the giving pledge and committing to giving the majority of his wealth to philanthropy. I am more than thrilled to introduce Robert Smith as the keynote speaker for this opening plenary session of the Association of African American Museums 2021 conference. Thank you so much, Kevin. Those are awesome words. Uh, everyone, I am just so thankful to Mr. Robert Smith for being here with us today and also uh, Jackie Reed. Um, you know, as we were looking around the field to figure out who was going to be this year's speaker, uh, I was really looking at the fact that, you know, we, we touch on so many areas in our field. Um, and as I was, you know, working with the board, I said, I think that we have a winner. I think that, you know, Mr. Robert Smith, with everything that he's done in our field writ large, uh, would really breathe um, life or additional life into our membership and would really be able to give some great words, departing words and words of encouragement to all of us. Um, and just everything that he's been able to do with museums and cultural institutions as far as philanthropy is concerned in our field. I mean, he's doing things for African-American museums and cultural centers. You, I mean, you can't, you can't get any more, you know, poignant than that. So thank you so much. And I am now passing my mic over to Mr. Robert Smith and Miss Jackie Reed. Thank you so much.
All right, everybody. This is such a, ple a pleasure for me. Robert F. Smith, we are going to have, you know what? I heard somewhere that you really prefer having a conversation, and so do I. So let's just have a conversation today. Sounds good. Good to see okay, you. Okay, right? Yeah, good absolutely. to see you, too. I feel like, you know, I was reading all of your accomplishments and all the awards that you have received, um, you know, over the years. And I feel like there should be a sir. I feel like the next one is coming from the Queen of England, even <laughs> though you are an American. I feel like there should be, it should be a sir, Sir Robert. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. I just feel like. You know, you've done so many amazing things, um, and we're going to dig into some of that today. But first, I just want to ask you, in light of everything that's been going on in the world, really in the last year and a half, you know, the, the pandemic from the virus, the racial awakening of this country, how are you, family, and loved ones doing? How are you doing right now? Yeah, it's uh, that's a great question. We're all asking our own family members this. Um, you know, I'm a child of, of, of the 60s and 70s. And, you know, I grew up in a time where there was another quote unquote racial awake, uh, awakening that created constant turmoil uh, in our communities. And, and in many cases, you know, loss of lo loved ones and family members due to, you know, frankly, just, you know, racist acts. And, you know, I, I see and feel that same uh, environment today with my own children and having our conversations and what is, you know, giving them, you know, uh, anxiety or what's giving them hope. And having these conversations is an important thing, but also taking action is, is even more important. So, you know, I see, I see us, uh, you know, realizing the importance of the beloved community, right? You know, this community where we are looking after each other and it's not just a physical looking after an economic but it's an emotional looking after of each other and checking in uh you know the pandemic separated many families physically um and of course you know and so in dealing with loss where you can't get together and grieve properly or or celebrate properly and during this time of a graduation season for many of our communities and our family um, you know, it is the first time that we've had a chance it's in many cases to see each other in a year, year and a half. Uh, so, you know, I, I appreciate you asking and uh, we are like every other family, you know, we are, we are, you know, driving forward. We are, you know, optimistic. We are dealing with the issues and uh, unpacking them and looking to, to support those in our, in our family who need the support uh, and to, uh, to, to continue as we do as African-Americans, uh, you know, strive forward. So that's, that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, you know. We were talking earlier before we started uh, this conversation about going back to work. You're a business owner. A lot of members of uh, AAAM, you know, were hard hit um, over this past year and a half um, as organizations. How are you handling as, you know, as a business owner going, you know, going back to these new guidelines, um, sure. you know, America is opening up again. How are you handling that? With yeah, we we're, 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 Jackie, we're engaging, you know, we're engaging with our, with our, you know, our employee base, our executives, our community, and, and looking to find what's right. You know, life will not be what it was like in 2019, and it's not going to be what it was like in 2020. You know, there's yeah. going to be some hybrid environment of engagement that we will all have to find what is this new equilibrium of in, interaction. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, people will be coming very much so back in the office, uh, but probably engaging with other of their you know business partners and community members differently. Um, in some cases, it'll be in person. Some cases, it'll be virtual. Some cases, it's going to be hybrid. Uh, and I think you know we should take some of the lessons from what we've learned in this pandemic about being a little more gentle up to our own planet uh, and not you know forcing everybody to be on the move and create you know call it uh, you know pollution and effects. That we've learned that uh, you know we can actually be in some cases as productive uh, without having you know putting the damage into our planet the way we have for you know for generations. So you know I'm, I'm looking forward to what I call more thoughtful uh, evaluation of how we have worked. Uh, we are soliciting and having you know multiple task force and evaluation at company level, portfolio company level, community level to figure out what the new answer is. Um, and I don't think anyone has the right answer, uh, but I think we will uh, be a lot more thoughtful than we have been in the past to try to come up with more a more sustainable equilibrium of, of engaging with each other 
being productive in business, enabling people to you know participate in the economy more broadly. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things I think is critically important is to be a little more gentle on our planet to, to ensure that it is sustainable for, for us as, as a life form on it. Oh, man, as a vegan, don't get me started talking about sustainability. Now you're talking <laughs> my language. Come right. on now. That's <laughs> critical. It's critical. It really is so important. Um, I want to ask you about this. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me and for so many people that I talked to, Robert, this last year and a half, again, with the pandemic and everything that came with it um, and the racial awakening, a lot of people, it, it caused them to kind of shift their focus on what's important, the way that they approach work, the way that they approach personal relationships, so many things. You, uh, Your experience as a Black man inspires much of what you do. How has the past year and a half um, impacted your goals to improve the lives of the most vulnerable, which is such important work for you? Yeah, I'll tell you, the probably what it has done is given me an opportunity to speak more clearly uh, to those who are now listening. You know, we as African Americans, as being a Black man, we we have dealt with, you know, this, this racial inequity on so many levels all of our lives, um, from the education systems that we were exposed to, to the knowledge, um, we'll talk a bit about that, that, that that was presented to us about who we are, our place in this country, our place in the world, our place in society, uh, and then how we had to navigate forward uh, in higher education, through the job market, through the professional market in many cases, through the labor market in other cases, uh, you know, through just driving back and forth to work or to school or to the airport or just you know, with, with your family and dealing with some of the challenges there. Um, I mean, the over-policing of, of many of our communities. So our lives in many respects, um, you know, didn't change that much on the one hand because we've always dealt with it. But what has happened is, you know, with, with the murder of George, George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and others uh, caught on film, you know, created an awakening that for uh, us, it opened ears and there was a more empathy, I'll say, and People say, well, well, wow, I didn't realize. Uh, and so the task of myself and others in, you know, uh, in, in our community was now to use this as an opportunity to promote uh, awareness and action uh, to eliminate some of the disparities. Uh, and frankly, I call them the deserts in our community. You know, there's broadband deserts, education deserts, food deserts, healthcare deserts. And now how do we drive resources into our community that are sustainable to enhance, you know, the overall quality of life uh, for African Americans uh, in particular. So that's what this has done: is created, you know, an openness to listen by corporations, by policymakers, and and I'm hopeful that that they embrace a number of the, you know, the the activities that have been put forward from the Latimer Plan to the Student Freedom Initiative, the Two Percent Solution, Six Cities Initiative. All these things I think are really driven towards improving the quality of uh, African-American life. And frankly, what that does is actually improve the overall GDP uh, opportunity in America and stabilize America uh, as, a, as a more creative force and, and for so that we can capture the economic opportunity in this fourth industrial revolution. So all those things are elements that we're just taking advantage of given now we have uh, an awakening and an, and an understanding of folks that you know this, these disparities are not sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a lot of folks um, here at AAAM are excited about um, how important, you know, preserving history and culture is to you. They know, I'm sure, that you're a major donor to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and you've been quoted as saying your goal is to preserve African, the African American experience. Why is the work of AAAM members so important? You know, it is, it is critical that people are able to frame themselves uh, in the communities they live and in the country in which they, they, are, they are, you know, living and looking to thrive. Um, you know, I grew up, I'm fourth generation from Colorado. And, you know, when I say that to a lot of East Coast people, say, I didn't know there are Black people in Colorado. Well, <laughs> people are now learning for the first time about uh, Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So if you look at, you know, my family, my, you know, family's history and extended family, you know, we, you know, migrated from with the uh, Cherokees, with the Choctaws from, you know, you know, into Texas, into Tulsa, into Greenwood, and then 
through the tragic massacre that occurred, ended up in Pueblo, Colorado, then moved up, you know, four generations ago into Denver, Colorado. So, you know, part of why the work is so important, because I'm just, I was, you know, growing up knowing all of this, I'm just amazed that people are hearing about it for the first time. Yeah. That's why that work is so important, you know, because if you lose the history of what has happened to our people, uh, then like you said, you know, you're, you're stand to repeat some of the atrocities as opposed to building in systems to ensure that that never happens. And frankly, that we have a chance to participate and thrive uh, going forward in this democracy. So, you know, it, growing up out here, I had the great benefit of the or, oral history of tradition. We had the Black, you know, American West History Museum. And, and while it wasn't necessarily taught in the schools, it was taught at home. It was taught, you know, in the barbecues. And, you know, as you heard about your relatives and, you know, who owned, you know, a billiard uh, 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 um, business in, in Greenwood or a hardware store in Greenwood or, the, you know, and you hear about these things, that gives you some sense of uh, place uh, and it gives you some sense of, of culture. Uh, and it also gives you some sense of inspiration about you know, what you can do if you live in what I call these beloved communities where you're supporting each other in business and commerce and in, in education and health. And I mean, that's what you think about and you hear about as you grow up in these communities that I found that you know, many people I went to school with back east and others had never heard of this before and it was just shocking to me so you know the work uh that you know that that historians and I'll say that you know historians that are framed in you know the African-American uh museum uh construct it's that work of those historians that is so critical because that is what actually drives uh you know the the culture and it captures our culture it captures our stories and it gives our young people something that they can point to and say, now here, I'm going to propel from there, as opposed to having to think they have to start over uh, each and every time without the, with the, without the context of history. So the AAAM is a critical um, you know, inst organization uh, to, bring, you know, to bring that capacity to our people uh, across the United States. And everybody's got different stories, but we need to be able to share those stories and, and, and draw strength from them. Uh, and and use those to to really inspire uh, us going forward. So Robert, just quickly before we get into what you're doing now, I just want to kind of get a little perspective on what planted this seed uh, for preserving history and heritage. So I want to explore your family history a little bit for those who don't know. Uh, you were there at the March on Washington when Dr. King um, gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, and your mother was the one who took you to that event. What do you remember most about that, Dan? Tell us a little bit about your mom. <laughs> Nothing. I was too young. Uh, <laughs> what I remember most about it is my family talking about how important it was uh, as I grew up, and the importance of, if you think about it, you know, it's a march on Washington for, you know, for uh, for jobs um, and, 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 and civil rights, but, you know, everyone thinks about and they forget about the jobs part of it. Um, and the important part was, you know, the economic uh, opportunity that Dr. King and others were, were saying was now due to African-Americans. And I think about that, you know, I thought about that in, as I grew up when I, you know, I grew up in a segregated neighborhood. There was one Japanese family outside of that was all African-American where I grew up. And I always say it was a beloved community. It was a community that took care of each other. You know, we had the you know, all of the, the, the infrastructure of, you know, from teachers to dentists to carpenters to, you know, who all provided, um, you know, for the community in different ways, you know, running or managing the grocery store, all those sorts of things. And, uh, but, you know, I do recall, and even sitting it now, you know, our community did not have banking um, infrastructure, did not have, uh, you know, a branch bank in our community. I remember when we had to go to the bank, my mom would get in the car and drive, you know, halfway across town to go to a, a local bank and nobody in that bank looked like us. And, you know, a big part of what's important and informs me is, you know, you've got to create sustainable ecosystems in these communities in order for them to thrive. So, you know, beyond, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of my mother and father and the way that they, they not only dedicated their time in their professional life as teachers, but in their after school and weekends, to serve, you know, the YMCA, to serve for the, you know, the, the what was in the, uh, the, the Civic Association, to serve, 
uh, in ensuring my mother, you know, would write these checks to the United Negro College Fund every month uh, and saying that you're part of a bigger and broader community. And, you know, part of your responsibility uh, is to do your part to contribute. Uh, in some cases, people's part was to look after the kids when they came home from school, when they're, before their parents came home from work. In some cases, it was reading to them, teaching to them. In some cases, it was teaching a group of us about rocketry. None of these people got paid or to play the piano. You know, these people, you know, in some cases got paid, but not a lot. But part of what they were doing was, was you know, educating our community. And part of that was educating about who we were and how we are self-sustainable. We, You and I chatted a little bit about this uh, when we were off camera. I mean, a big part of, the, I call it the West, was you know you had to re depend and rely on each other as a community because there was no other infrastructure of support, and I think that self reliance, uh, you know, became a part of our DNA, and and that is a big part of what what has made uh, our community strong in these uh, in these parts of of the U.S. Yeah, well, speaking of DNA, let's talk about the Robert F. Smith Explore Your History Center at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. What was your vision uh, for setting that up? Sure. You know, the, the world of technology enables so much. Um, and when you think about it, you know, part of what we seek as people, all people, they want to know where they came from and what is the stories that led to them being who they are and where they are. Uh, and, you know, what this center is designed to do is to create an onboarding of these stories and the connectivity and the pictures and the history and start to link more with what we have in various <clears throat> databases that are available. And if you think, you know, you keep going and if you think about every family contributing their story, because literally, you know, you have in, in dimensions of capacity <laughs> around it. Uh, and those stories can be oral histories, can be, you know, the, the genealogy, but then you start to contribute pictures. Now think about this, you know, I'm in Colorado and I start contributing pictures and maybe three people in the picture that I know and one person in the picture that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I know these three, these are my uncles and aunts, but who is this one person? Well, you know, over time, you can actually look at some, use some artificial intelligence and match that picture with some other picture and say, oh, wow, that is someone else. And you figure out that your family may have had a relationship with that family, you know, two or three and four generations ago uh, that then starts to ex expand uh, a lot more about, you know, who you are in the context of what you're doing today. So that's what the theory, the, the, the theory is and what's, what's designed today. We've had, you know, I think, you know, 60, 70 virtual sessions in the last year, over 25,000 visitors. And part of what we're looking for uh, is to digitize, you know, the work that, you know, our parents and grandparents and great grandparents had in terms of pictures or videos or movies, and then start to curate that content in a way that creates more uh, more uh, connectivity, you know, the connection of the diaspora ultimately. And they'll give a repository of a place where we can all go, some physically and then ultimately, you know, virtually to go explore more about ourselves and the communities that we lived in or the communities that our parents lived in or great grandparents and, and give some color and texture to all of that. So we see the richness, you know, we've been talking about Tulsa and all of a sudden videos are showing up of the life in, in Greenwood. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for many of us, we saw that, you know, years ago, but now people for the first time are realizing what a prosperous African-American community looked like 100 years ago. Those are the sorts of expressions and experiences that, that all Americans should have access to. And it's our job uh, and the curators of that as, as, you know, the AAAM is to contribute to that in a way that we all can benefit in the entire ecosystem and not just individual instances of, of, of repositories of information. Yeah. Well, in, in order for the members of AAAM um, to continue this important work, fundraising is key, Robert, and you are a master at fundraising. And I wonder if you could just share some tips for these organizations when it comes to fundraising, what advice would you give um, you know, to these members? It is important to demonstrate the value uh, to those who are contributing. What is it that they're contributing towards? Uh, and to be efficient, um, you know, donors. And I, I think, you know, I'm a member of the Giving Pledge and, you know, yeah. I have an opportunity to, to spend time with, you know, some of the, I'll call it the, the biggest philanthropists in the United States. And what they're looking for is value. They're looking for what does this dollar lead to 
on the one hand, and also what is the efficacy, the efficiency by which you're going to use this, this capital. And it isn't just hire more people, okay, jobs are important, but it's also how you're gonna leverage you know, technology to expand the reach. Um, you know, I've been doing some, some work with myself and Fund2 Foundation, for instance, and partnering with the National Parks Foundation. Mm -hmm. And what we've been able to do is now beyond preserving historical monuments in places like the birth home and life home of Martin Luther King or Frederick Douglass or Carter G. Woodson, Harriet Tubman, you know, Booker T. Washington, the Pullman Museum is also now say, okay, how do we do a digital overlay? And how do we create an overlay so that people at that park uh, actually are having different levels of experiences, not just walking through and seeing it, but using their technology, which might be their, their, their cell phones, et cetera, that bring those experiences to life and help people get greater context around what was happening, what was occurring, and what were the, you know, the inspirational moments or thoughts or, or, or dynamics associated with the people who have charted you know, uh, some of the direction of who we are as a nation, these African Americans. So you have to invest in the resources of, of building out and preserving the, the environment, i.e. the physical infrastructure, okay. But you also have to say, here's where we're now going. And here's what we're going to do in, in leveraging digital technologies to, to expand the experience set. You know, the younger generation, now that they are digital natives, uh, they don't necessarily have the, the desire to visit every one of these places. Uh, and like we used to pile in the car and, you know, take the long trips and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, they need to have access from where they sit, meet them where they are, which is why we do things like Black History in Two Minutes. Uh, where we're actually able to to provide you know short content that is you know call it you know fact packed accurate historical perception or perspectives of who we are in this country, and then when they go to these locations, they can now start to expand upon what exactly happened and what occurred and how that can inspire them. So it's important for uh, you know museum uh, uh, curators and managers to to really demonstrate the value, but also lean forward and think about what is the new museum. Uh, I always tease Lonnie Bunch about this, uh, who now, as you know, is the secretary of the of the uh, uh, Smithsonian Museum. I say, Lonnie, you know, if, if the museums aren't alive, then they just become temples. And part of what we need to do is make sure these museums are alive and bring the voices uh, to life and using technology is, I think, an efficient way to do it. Yeah, I love that. I'm just thinking about those days when you piled in the car for a family trip and there's like chicken and foil and all oh, yeah. <laughs> cold oh, yeah. chicken and foil. <laughs> right. And the pickle jars, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, come oh, on yeah. now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, listen, as a graduate of an HBCU, I, I proudly graduated from Clark Atlanta University. Uh, I was very excited, as so many folks were, with what you did. Uh, erasing that student debt for those that graduating class at Morehouse College. And you do a lot of work um, for students, particularly students of colors um, at HBCUs. Why is this such an important work for you and your organization? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we all have to realize that, you know, we are in the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution. And unlike the last three industrial revolutions, this one's going to move a lot faster. And it is going to enable those who participate in it to accelerate and those who don't will be left further behind. And it is critically important that we create the on-ramps for African-Americans uh, in particular to participate in this industrial revolution. We didn't participate in the other three in a meaningful economic upside opportunity way but we have to do it here. So what I'm focused on is how do we build more of those on-ramps? Part of it is infrastructure. We just announced with the Student Freedom Initiative, uh, we just got another grant or grant from, from Cisco and ABC Technologies where we will enable uh, and the infrastructure for all the HBCUs to now participate, call it 4G, you moving to 5G, uh, which enables all these students now to participate in, in this new economy and frankly preserves uh, part of the federal funding, um, you know, for, for Title IV for these HBCUs, if they aren't compliant, they'll lose that funding. So this now enables them all to be compliant and now have access to it. Well, the second part of that, of course, is, you know, how do we ensure that these students through this infrastructure now can participate 
in a broader economic opportunity, and that is things like intern X, et cetera, which are for STEM students and now go get internships. I think we have 170 or so corporate partners now as part of that platform and about 13,000 uh, HBCU students as part of it. But it's that sort of exposure and opportunity that we have to provide our students because if we don't, uh, I will guarantee you this fourth industrial revolution will move on without us. Yeah. And if we aren't participating in it, we will not capture the economic benefit of it and we cannot drive that back into our community and that creates a whole destabilization activity uh, that we don't want to have in this country in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are almost out of time, Robert. I have one last question for you sure. and that is just got to talk to you about this optimism that you had. It seems to me, I do not know you, but from the interviews that I've watched, you know, what I've read about you, your glass seems to be always half full. Maybe not every day, <laughs> but many days, many days. And I just want to know what inspires you? What keeps you going? I know you're a problem solver. I mean, I think you get up and you're like excited about the day. Like where, where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot comes from uh, my faith. Uh, I get up in the mornings and first thing I do is I, I, I read or listen to scripture and do some meditation. Uh, and then I move forward. Uh, and I, you know, I grew up, I think, just knowing that part of what my life's mission and work is, is to go create change. And you have to find the inspiration and your truth that helps you do that. And that's where I find mine. And, you know, it is, uh, it is true and it, and it is inspiring and it is uh, a never ending source. And so that's how I do it. It is true. That is a never ending source. Well, sir, as I'm going to call you, sir, Robert, F. <laughs> <laughs> it has been such a pleasure um, talking with you here today. You're such an inspiration. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jackie, so much. And again, to the to the community of AAAM, uh, I would just say keep doing your 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 work. Uh, it's critical and important that our youth and our people know who they are uh, and know how valuable they are and help them understand how to create more beloved communities that we can all thrive in. So thank you for your time and, and thanks for all your support. Hi, Robert. From the entire team of the Robert F. Smith Center for the Digitization and Curation of African-American History, we say thank you. Thank you for your support for the preservation of community archives and local history. And we are extremely excited about our partnership with the Association of African American Museums and the Smith Center. And we are thrilled that you are part of it today. Since 2017, the Smith Center has partnered with communities across the country, helping families to preserve their most fondest memories and helping institutions make their collections more accessible. So far, we've been to Baltimore, we ended in Chicago, and in between, we visited your hometown of Denver, Colorado. We've also been working in our local communities here in the District of Columbia, Virginia, and Maryland area. Soon, when it is safe, we will be headed to New Orleans, as well as continuing to work in our local communities here in the DMV. Our emerging professionals have interned across the country including at our beloved historically black colleges and universities like Bethune-Cookman University, Tuskegee University, and Morgan State, as well as other institutions across the country like the Stagville Historic Site in North Carolina, the Heinz Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the Maine Historic Society. And when COVID hit, and we were all quarantined, and when the social and racial unrest showed us that we needed to be available to our communities, we turned over the community curation platform so those families and institutions could upload their experiences during that difficult time. And Robert, it is just the beginning. With our new director on board, Director Kevin Young, and his vision to be more engaged with communities, as well as his emphasis on the digital present, we know that this center will be leading our charge in digital humanities, working to raise up the next generation of scholars in the field, working to do more in genealogy. We know that we will be taking a lead in that discussion. We thank you again for all of your support and hard work in this field. 
and we look forward to the next leg of the journey. Thank you again. Um, yeast rolls were, you know, the thing um, in our family, and I thought it had died with her. And um, so when uh, it showed up, you know, in this box, <laughs> when it showed up in this box, I'm very happy. I was very, very happy. My name is Lisa Daniels, and I brought Granny's recipes. Uh, my grandmother is Shirley Hurd. She passed away in 2015. So I asked him, I said, does Granny happen to have any um, aprons? And he said, no. He said, there are no aprons, but uh, there's that old recipe box sitting on the, on the counter in there in the kitchen, and I'm like, and he handed this to me and I wept. I was just, I was blown away. Every individual, every family, every community has a story. At the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we want to give individuals, families, and communities the opportunity to share their stories with current and future generations. And through the Community Curation Program, we strive to do just that. Ready? The innovative program, hosted by the Center for the Digitization and Curation of African American History, invites the public to have their personal flat items and audiovisual materials digitized by our expert staff. Photographs and tintypes, recipes and diplomas, audio recordings and home videos. These are the things we hold dear, and taken together, our individual stories define our collective history. But these items have shelf lives that are shorter than one would think. By digitizing community materials and sharing the stories behind them, we can ensure that everyday American history is preserved. To bring the community curation program to life, the museum collaborates with archiving institutions across the country. In 2019, the museum worked with the Black Metropolis Research Consortium and its member institutions to host community curation in Chicago. I started my work as an oral historian with family oral history, so I'm very impressed with what you've done here. At each stop, we hold free digitization sessions, workshops on genealogy and preservation, and many programs exploring the history and culture of the local community. In Chicago, those interactions led us to stories that were at once incredibly universal and deeply personal. And the Center for the Digitization and Curation of African American History is grateful that communities continue to trust us to preserve and share these treasures. And when I heard that uh, the opportunity to digitize all of this stuff and keep it in one place uh, was available, I could not come. So here I am um, with with what um, remains of that part of my history and I get to share this with my granddaughter and my grandson.